Hi, my name's Aidan O'Donnell and I work at the University of Edinburgh and I'm going to talk to you today about the rhythmicity of malaria parasites. In the Reese lab, we apply an evolutionary approach to studying malaria and ask questions about what roles hosts and parasites play in shaping infection. If we can understand how and why parasites are doing what they're doing, we hope to make disease control measures more effective. Recently, we've been interested in the roles of biological rhythms and how they affect an organism's fitness. Previous work has shown that biological rhythms matter for host fitness. Arabidopsis are less able to control bacterial infection when they're infected at night, whereas Drosophila um, have a higher mortality rate when they're infected with bacteria during the day, and even higher mortality if they don't have a functioning clock. But biological rhythms also matter for parasite fitness, such as in the example of filarial worms that move from the deep tissues to the capillaries in the skin in a timing that matches the activity of the biting vector, maximizing the parasite's transmission. In our lab, we use rodent malaria as a model organism. Malaria parasites have rhythms in their asexual development inside the host, termed the intraerythrocytic development cycle, or thankfully, the IDC. On the left is a pictogram of the IDC of the malaria parasite, starting with red blood cell invasion, parasite development, and eventual red blood cell bursting. It's this cycle that's responsible for disease symptoms of the host. The rodent species we study have an IDC of 24 hours, but cycles of multiples of 24 hours are found across many malaria species. For example, the human malaria species have cycles of 24, 48, and 72 hours. And just to give you an idea of what the parasites really look like, here's some pictures. Our rodent species go through various cell forms throughout the 24 hours, but for simplicity, I'm just showing you two key parasite stages that are reliably identified by blood smears. You can see the ring stage in purple typically arise in the nighttime, indicating the beginning of a new generation of parasites. These then disappear in a day as they develop into the next stage, the trophozoites, in green. We believe these cycles are important to malaria parasites. But to start to understand them, we want to determine what host cues, if any, parasites are using to keep time. We broadly ask the question of whether host central rhythms or peripheral rhythms were more important to malaria parasites. I know this is very much a simplification, but central rhythms are primarily entrained by light schedules, while peripheral rhythms, such as those in the stomach and liver, are kept in synchrony with the central clock, but can be independently entrained by altered host feeding schedules. So we set up infections in two groups of mice in the same lighting schedule and fed each group on opposite feeding schedules. If the central clock was important, we would expect parasites in both groups to be in phase, since the host shares the same light schedule. If the peripheral clock matters most, then we would expect parasites to be out of phase, matching the feeding schedule. So what do we find? Well, here's the results for the night-fed group, which is the normal situation for a nocturnal mouse. The parasites are in the phase we'd expect, with ring stages illustrated here, peaking at night. When we overlay the day-fed groups, however, we can see that ring stages peak in the daytime, 12 hours apart from the night-fed groups. The mice, the parasites, are following the feeding rhythms, not the light. So it looks like host peripheral rhythms are important. However, in this experiment, we have two signals with the same timing. The signal from the clock telling the host to feed, and a signal of food appearing in the bloodstream after digestion. Our next goal is to try to separate these two signals. We want to ask which of these rhythms were most important to malaria parasites. And to do this, we used a combination of arrhythmic per 1-2 knockout mice and a time-restricted feeding regime. We designed an experiment where we gave parasites to four groups of mice, all housed in DED. We have our wild-type controls that were given 24 hours access to food, but 
Due to an intact clock, they will naturally keep the majority of their feeding and activity to one big chunk of time. Then in our second group, we have the wild types again, but this time we restricted their feeding to only 10 hours per day, and on an opposite timing to the wild type match group earlier. Then we have our clock knockouts, but we've restricted their feeding similar to the wild type rescheduling group. These mice will be arrhythmic for activity and clock signals, but will have rhythms in feeding since their food is only available in a rhythmic fashion. And then our fourth group, the clock knockouts again, but this time we've given them ad lib access to food. So these mice will be arrhythmic both in host clock signals and in feeding. Infections can normally be started by injecting infected blood from donors into another mouse, and this inoculum is usually synchronous. But for this experiment, we started all infections with an asynchronous parasite inoculum, where all parasite stages are present. This gave every infection treatment a fair start, and it meant we could also investigate how synchronicity changes along with phase. If parasite rhythms were driven by host clock signals, we would expect parasites would only become synchronous in wild type hosts. However, if feeding matters more than host clock signals, we would expect the restricted fed clock knockouts to also become synchronous. In both cases, we would expect the last group, the all day fed clock knockouts, to remain asynchronous. So what do we find? So again, I'm showing you the proportions of the ring stage parasites. In the top plot, we have parasites in our wild type controls, and we can see the parasites are highly rhythmic. Same thing with our restricted fed wild type group, but the parasites are now in phase with the feeding schedule opposite to that of the previous group. This is somewhat of a repeat of the result I showed you earlier. To jump to the fourth group, the clock knockout mice, without feeding rhythms or clock signals, parasites are greatly dampened. They have remained asynchronous. But if you apply feeding rhythms to these clock knockout hosts, parasites emulate those of a wild type mouse, right down to a similar phase that matches feeding. While many signs point to feeding, it's important to rule out other obvious signals like host locomotor activity and body temperature. You can see that while activity and temperature were disrupted in the restricted fed wild type in blue, it's not the complete inverse of the matched group in yellow orange. These can't explain the rhythms we see, so we believe these host signals are simply not as important as feeding to parasite rhythms. So to summarize so far, parasites are not aligning to host light schedule, activity, or body temperature. Instead, parasites are aligning to the time hosts feed. Further, these rhythms can be generated, generated independent of a functional host clock. Of course, I know there are many underlying rhythms in clock knockout hosts, such as food anticipatory rhythms or blood redox rhythms. But so far, we do believe that feeding is our best candidate cue for parasites. Something I haven't highlighted is that while parasites can be injected out of sync with the host, they do get back on time and match host timing. So how do they reschedule? Parasites could choose to speed up their development, but this gives them less time to eat and less time to prepare the red blood cell as a home. Or they could slow down their development which may be risky as the immune system might catch them. Of course, they could do a combination of both or simply arrest themselves to get back on time in one cycle. So we designed an experiment to figure this out. We set up infection similar to the previous experiment with two wild type groups that are on opposite feeding schedules, i.e. parasites are needing to are either gonna be matched to hosts or have to reschedule. We also included the third mutant cl uh, clock knockout group where feeding is restricted, just to have a group that's clean of host TTFL rhythms. However, to get good period measures, we need to sample the mice for multiple parasite cycles. And we've found in the past, when we sampled the mice for more than 24 hours, this leaves the mice feeling really rough and potentially messes with our parasite results. 
So instead, we split each treatment into subgroups and staggered the infections of these subgroups by a day. That way, when we sample all the mice at the same human time, we have four different days of infection duration. We can piece these subgroups together to get a multi-day time series that we can use to get more accurate measures of parasite IDC period. So what do we find? First off, we have the matched group, where parasites don't need to change much at all. We find that the period, while not 24 hours, is pretty close to 24 hours. But in both the rescheduling groups, the period is sped up by one to two hours. And you can kind of see a shift to the left in these ring stage proportions shown here. To determine if the speed of rescheduling was dose dependent, we repeated the experiment at two different doses, a dose 10 times lower than the first experiment and a dose 10 times higher. While the high dose is a little slower, both groups are one to two hours shorter than the matched group from the first experiment. Therefore, we don't believe dose really makes a difference to the speed of rescheduling. So what have we learned about parasite rescheduling? We've shown that the parasites are able to reschedule and recover from jet lag within five to six cycles, and that this process is not dependent on parasite density. We show that the parasites recover from jet lag by speeding up their development, i.e. shortening their IDC duration. Overall, this suggests that parasites may have control over their IDC duration. Their IDC duration is a plastic trait. So why should parasites keep time at all? Are there any consequences to not keeping time? Early work suggests that having to reschedule is bad. My 2011 experiments showed that rescheduling led to a 50% reduction in growth stages and also in transmission stages. And then I did more experiments, and I found that while it's true that jet lag is bad, it seems this may only be true if you start the infections with ring stage parasites, and trephozoite stage parasites actually benefit from jet lag. This is confusing and kind of frustrating, but does suggest that the costs accrue early in the infection, when the parasites are still in the same stage they were when injected. And then I did more experiments, and I found that when looking at cumulative parasite densities the, uh, of the infections tracked for multiple days, I found that I didn't see any apparent differences between matched or rescheduled parasites at all. Right. But when you look back at the ring stage proportions, we can see that while the matched groups go through just over four cycles, the rescheduling groups are ahead due to their shorter IDC and have completed five full cycles. Given at this point in the infection, parasites are growing exponentially, we should see higher numbers in the rescheduling group, but we don't, suggesting there may be some hidden costs of rescheduling. So in summary, I repeated some experiments and now my why becomes a huh. In some parasite strain host strain combinations, the costs of rescheduling are really apparent. However, some parasite stages exhibit tolerance to jet lag, which is not unexpected as stage differences in tolerance to heat shock and drugs have also been shown. My last experiment showed that costs may not always be obvious, but there may be some hidden costs of rescheduling. Perhaps rescheduling parasites are making fewer clones at each IDC cycle. So why are parasites keeping time at all? Well, as with the case with many rhythms of life, there are environmental resources that are only transiently available. For malaria parasites, there are several resources the parasite must scavenge. One such resource, the amino acid isoleucine, the parasite must acquire from host food. Could this resource be both a reason to keep time and a host cue? It's true that if you take away isoleucine from parasites, they slow down their IDC but they resume normal speed on the re-addition of isoleucine. I also suggested that IDC duration may be a plastic trait, and control over their IDC duration could be a strategy that benefits parasites in real-world situations, such as during chronic infections. Some evidence to support a plastic IDC strategy is that in response to anti-malarial drugs, parasites will slow their development, allowing them to tolerate the drugs 
Further, when the parasite gene serpentine receptor 10 is knocked out of parasites, the parasites exhibit the same fast IDC phenotype we observe during rescheduling. This suggests that maybe this gene plays a role in controlling IDC duration. Finally, there's the obvious question of how realistic is it a parasite would need to change its rhythmicity at all? African rats don't really get jet lag. So work in our lab suggests that this is important to every transmission event. When parasites are injected into a new host by a mosquito, they first develop tens of thousands of parasites in the liver. We found that these liver stages are released into the bloodstream asynchronously across 24 hours, rather than all in one go. So, at the start of every infection, parasites start their life in the bloodstream completely out of sync with their host. And they must quickly readjust to get back on the phase that matches feeding. So I hope I've given you a brief overview of the rhythmicity of malaria parasites. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, so please check out our website in the bottom right and send me an email if you have any other questions. Thank you for listening.